Okay. When you read nonfiction like this book, When Lunch Fights Back, Wickedly Clever Animal Defenses, you don't always read it the same way you read a story. In fact, I recommend you check out the text features. You look at the back. It says newts that can pop their rib bones right through their skin, termites that carry poison-filled backpacks, lizards that can shoot blood from their eyes. Some animals are good at self-defense. These animals are amazing. So watch out. Um, right now, if your screen is off, I hope it's off and you're listening. I hope it's not off so that you can goof around and play a video game or something. Many of you with your screens off do not have permission to have them off. That just makes me write on your report card that you keep turning your screen off even though I keep asking you not to. So if you don't have permission to have your screen off, you need to have it on, my friends. Some of you have permission and you know who you are. But right now, I only see one person on the screen who has permission to have their screen off. So just saying. Here we go. When I look in here, I see that it says chapter one, slipped sliming away. Chapter two, concealed weapons. So it looks like they grouped it by defense, like the method of defense. So I'm not sure I have to read it in order, but I'm going to start with the introduction, which says the challenge of survival introduction, the challenge of survival. It shows like a monster breaking through, but remember this is nonfiction. Okay, I'm gonna spotlight my screen so you can see the pictures better. Here we go. All right, oh, Eli's just in time. No one said living on planet Xenon would be easy. Hungry aliens are everywhere. A new group just slithered into view. The aliens are well armed with lasers and a contraption that shoots out nets for capturing prey. The prey, of course, is you. You roll your shoulders and grip the video game controls, thumbs poised over the buttons. You're ready to defend yourself with weapons of your own. You're not going down without a fight. Win or lose, though, the battle on planet Xenon is just a game. Not so here on planet Earth. On Earth, the challenge of survival is a real and serious business. In the wild, every living thing is constantly at risk of being eaten by something else. Good defenses can mean the difference between surviving a predator's attack and becoming its lunch. Sharp teeth and claws are common defensive weapons among Earth's animals. So are clever camouflage and being very, very good at hiding. And don't forget speed for fast getaways. But if you think that's the best nature can do, be prepared to be surprised. Good defenses can mean the difference between life and death. Chapter one. Slip sliming away. And I'm going to show you a little video just to get you interested and focused on listening to the words here. So let me share this little video. It's only 45 seconds long. Watch this. That's a weird thing, huh? Uh-oh, what's going on? Some audio? <laughs> Have you ever seen anything like that before? Is there audio? Wait a minute, where's all that goo coming from? Wait, where's the audio? Is there no hmm. audio? I don't hear anything. <laughs> I don't hear anything. Hagfish slime. Hmm. All right. I didn't hear Let's anything. Show. Link it down. I have a question. This charming little fellow is in a canoderm in the clan's hollow. How about hagfish slime? Have you ever heard of a hagfish before? No, and I kind of go on now. You're going to hear now. Here we go. A hagfish slithers along the ocean bottom, moving like a snake. Here's a picture of it. Pretty ugly little critter. This primitive deep sea creature is nearly blind, but has a keen sense of smell. It picked up the scent of a dead whale from more than a mile away. The hagfish follows the smell through the water. When it reaches the whale's carcass, it swims around the remains, sizing up the feast. Then the hagfish sinks its teeth into the dead whale's soft, rotting flesh and takes a big, yummy bite. Mmm, dead whale. I just love dead whale. Ow! Oh, <laughs> As the hagfish eats, a shark arrives. The shark isn't interested in the whale though, it's after fresh meat. Slowly circling, the shark edges closer to the hagfish until it's just inches away. In a blur of movement, the shark strikes. 
It grabs the hagfish in its toothy jaws and instantly lets go. The shark's mouth is overflowing with thick, snot-like goo. <laughs> the slimy stuff fills its throat and clogs its gills. Without gills to pull oxygen from the water, the shark can't breathe. It thrashes its head from side to side with jerky, desperate movements. Unharmed, the hagfish pays no attention. Strings of slime still ooze from its long, rubbery body as it goes back to eat. Uh, the shark convulses with what looks like a giant cough. Clouds of slime billow out from its gills and throats. Finally, able to breathe again, the shark dots, darts away without a backward glance. Pretty cool. How'd you like to be able to slime your enemy? The science behind the story. Hagfish aren't fish, despite their name. They're primitive eel-like animals that have roamed the ocean for millions of years. Hagfish have no jaws and no backbone. What they do have, however, is slime. Douglas Fudge, so no. D Douglas Fudge is a biologist at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. He's been studying hagfish and their slimy defenses since 1997. Quote, the slime is amazingly effective at preventing hagfish from being eaten by fish predators, including sharks, comma, quotation mark, said Fudge. So that right there, Nora, is how they showed us that those words were not their words, they were his words. And that makes their argument stronger because they're quoting an expert, which is what you guys should be learning to do with your writing. Hagfish release slime the moment something tries to bite them or even just bothers them. Fudge has been slimed many times while gently handling hagfish in his laboratory. The slime comes from a special gland in the hagfish's skin. The glands actually release two chemical ingredients that combine to make the slime. One ingredient is slippery mucus. The other is thread-like fibers. Hagfish slime is the only slime we know of in nature that has fibers, Fudge explained. Here's the slimy hagfish on his hands. Ew. When a predator such as a shark bites, a lot happens in a short time. Mucus is ejected from the glands as tiny little packages. Fiber is ejected as coiled threads. The mucus swells, the fibers uncoil the moment they contact the seawater. The fibers and mucus together form an intricate net network that traps the seawater. The result is a mixture that expands tremendously and incredibly fast. It all happens in about 100 milliseconds or a tenth of a second, said Fudge. In other words, the hagfish can make great gobs of slime in the blink of an eye. It's a nearly undefeatable defense. This book has got a lot of other defenses. I'm going to skip ahead to this other one I know you're going to love, although that one's good too. The next one is um, concealed weapons, animals that have sharp um, claws that jab through their skin to stab their enemies like the ribs of a salamander or the feet of a frog. Then there's the termites with a toxic bubble. Then, ah, oh, this is the one I knew you'd like. Master blasters. Have you ever heard of a hopeboe? It's this little bird. Let me see if you can see them. Can you see the little bird there? Oh yeah, I can see that. The hopeboe chicks snuggle together in their nest inside a hollow tree. Aren't they cute? They're okay. only a few days old. It will be weeks before they can fly. In okay. the forest outside, the chicks can hear their parents softly calling, whoop, whoop, whoop. The parent birds repeat the call again and again as they gather insects for their chicks to eat. A moment later though, the chicks hear something else, the scritch scratching of sharp claws on the tree bark. Uh-oh, dun, dun, dun. Suddenly their parents are loudly whoop, whoop, whooping. The chicks hear an angry flutter of wings followed by a snarl and a hiss. The parents keep up the attack, but to no avail. A dark shape appears at the nest entrance. Green eyes framed by long whiskers peer in at the chicks. It's a cat on the prowl for lunch. What do you think the babies are gonna do to defend themselves? Anybody have an no. idea? What? Get, I'm guessing they're gonna yeah, they're gonna They're gonna do, uh, uh, the, they're gonna go, um, do the censored area. Do the let's, let's see what happens. It sounds like you've heard this before. The chicks are ready though. They know instinctively what to do. All together, they turn their backs on the <laughs> The chicks lean forward, lift their tiny rumps and shoot streams of foul smelling poop directly into the cat's face. Ow! <laughs> Hey, oh, but no, 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 no. Uh, it's a howl and a scream.
screech uh, as a cat hits the ground running, trying desperately to escape the incredible stench. Ooh, oh, 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 oh. toxic oh. poopers. Here's the parent bird, the hope boy. Aren't they pretty? Yeah. <laughs> While hope boy chicks defend themselves with streams of stinky poop, their parents try to fight off the predators with sharp beaks and strong wings. Okay, that's reasonable, but I don't like how the chicks defend themselves. <laughs> Here's another kind of bird that has the same defense, but it's a little different. Let's keep reading. And then I'll show you one more video and then we'll be done with read aloud for today. This one is called a fulmar. See this bird? Like a big kind of seagull-like animal. A fulmar chick sits alone on a rocky ledge high on a windswept cliff. One wrong step and it could easily fall. It would plunge to its death in the cold ocean far below since it's not able to fly yet. So the chick is careful. It simply sits, hardly moving, waiting for its parents to return. They're catching fish far out at sea. Other birds, however, are looking for food closer to home. A broad-winged skua soars past the cliff. Skuas eat mostly fish, but given a chance, they will gobble up the chicks of almost any other bird. Oh, the poor Omar. The poor innocent fulmar. The skua scoops in and lands on the ledge. It sizes up the chick with black beady eyes. Here's the enemy bird. The chick seems to shrink into itself and gives out a faint chirp. Emboldened, the skua steps closer. It takes one step, then two. A third step brings it within range. Uh -oh. This time, the fulmar chick opens its mouth wide as if it's going to scream, but that isn't what comes out of the chick's mouth. Instead, a scream, a putrid yellow vomit <laughs> erupts from the chick's mouth. It throats and it, it erupts from its throat and sails through the air. The foul smelling stinky stuff hits the skewa hard, splattering all over one wing. The skewa takes off, surprised and alarmed. It has no ideas. Its days may be numbered. Hmm. I wonder why its days are numbered. I wonder if the, the vomit is uh, poisonous. Let's see. Fulmar vomit. The word fulmar means foul gull. The name refers, here it is vomiting, but we're going to watch it too in a minute. Name refers to the fishy smelling vomit, which they spew onto anything that threatens them. A fulmar chick can hit a moving target up to six feet away. It can also hurl out about a half dozen blasts of vomit in quick succession, so one after another. Scientists have discovered that they can even defend themselves with vomit while hatching before they're all the way out of their shells if something comes along trying to get them while they're hatching. Fulmar vomit is mostly a mixture of oily substances secreted by this bird's stomach water. It's terrible smelling and sticky as glue. Once it gets on the bird's feathers, no amount of cleaning will remove it. In studying the vomit, they've surprised it can be a very deadly weapon. The chemicals of the oil gradually destroy the waterproof coating on the feathers of many types of birds. Without the coating, the feathers become matted, waterlogged, and useless. When seabirds whose feathers are contaminated with the fulmar chick vomit land on the ocean, they may not be able to take off again, and eventually they drown. But fulmars are immune to their own vomit. They can't, scientists can't even explain why, but fulmars can clean the stuff off and their feathers suffer no ill effects. That means their parents don't have to worry. <laughs> this is a great book, When Lunch Fights Back, if you can find it again. And the other cool thing about this book is at the back, it has links to um, videos. And here's one, it's called Fooled by Nature, Fulmar Chick Vomit, which we're gonna watch a little of right now. Fooled by Nature. Fulmer chick vomit. Here we go. Let's see if we can find it. Ah, it didn't come up. Fulmer boiler. Ah, oh, where'd it go? Hmm. All right. That makes me mad when it doesn't pop up. Let me see what else it says here. Maybe it's not on here. Fooled by nature. Fulmer chicks vomit. Science, how stuff works. The science of how stuff works. Let's see if we put that in, if that helps. Science of how stuff works. Hmm. It doesn't seem 
to be working. Oh, well, we don't get to watch that, but that's okay. All right, so back to our science project today. 